Hello folks, this is a retooling, a scripted version of my first D&D stories as the first one was long, filled with open air and so many ums you'd think I was in meditation. Uh, these stories are inspired to be told by one pro Jared, a fellow YouTuber with a love of Dungeons and Dragons who's played much longer than I have. He started up the idea of D&D Simber where we all share our stories and ideas of Dungeons and Dragons, and I hope to bring some entertainment with some of the D&D stories that I have. My very first story comes from 3.5 Dungeons and Dragons, and this is the campaign that we called The Casserole of Evil, because every character was an evil alignment and pretty much pulled their power from different sources, divine, arcane, some such like that. This was a game with me as a DM, with a DMPC Asimer cleric, my brother, who played a tiefling sorcerer slash binder, which was this class that bound otherworldly spirits to themselves to gain some trippy and sometimes awesome benefits, and our friend Link playing a Diabolus warlock slash blood mages. Diabolus, by the way, being these denizens of the demi plane of nightmares with demon like horns and very demonic appearance. My brother's character, Frey, was an erratic individual. Uh, he took any chaotic spells that he could find that caused him to do stuff like randomly cause 2d20 damage to everyone within 20 feet of him while dancing around like a madman. And the spirits that he bound to himself were the ones that made his character sound like he smoked a pack of cigarettes every day for 20 years while giving him bonuses to charisma based checks. Also his familiar was a purple butterfly he named Flutters. My DM PC, Errant, didn't start as a cleric. He was originally going to be this pirate-like badass with one eye and was a master of the spear, which at the time of making Errant, there wasn't many options to make a really good fighter. There was only the complete warrior. I didn't realize this until around level 5 or so, when the sorcerer and the warlock were doing more damage than the dude with a pointed stick. Eventually, I remade Errant as a cleric, giving him a tragic backstory and a real reason to hate good aligned religions. Eventually, he became a Warrior of Darkness from the Book of Vile Darkness, which made him even more of a badass, giving him the ability to make ointments that gave him permanent bonuses, making him stronger and tougher. This paired well with my cleric levels, because most all of my spells were buffing spells. Really, I only had a couple of offensive spells that I'd been even bothering preparing, like Flame Strike and Comet Fall. Link's character still was different in that he was more about spreading chaos than evil. It's funny how those two usually go hand in hand. He started as Warlock and loved the crap out of it. It's pretty much his go-to spellcasting class if we ever play D&D 3.5. Syl was a mad individual and was for some reason obsessed with becoming a demon. I really don't know why. I think Link at some point stated that humans looked at him like he was a demon anyways, so why not play the role, right? After much debating on it though, he prestiged into a blood mages, which is as gnarly of a class as it sounds. It had a bunch of things that Syl never used, like the homunculus, the ability to make potions, the death knell once per day ability. And I come to think of it, Link has come out to say he hates once per day spells and abilities. Just drives him mad. So early in the game, I decided to inquire about the party getting a place to have as a base. I had listed a couple of places off that they could try to take over and they chose this Tower of Woe, this location from the Tome of Magic supplement that was so anti-evil magic and anti-binder an evil gods clerics aligned with two good gods clerics to rid the world of this quote unquote menace. We decided to invade the tower around level 5 which was not a good idea because the tower itself was something like level 8, full with paladins, redeemed hill giants, and gargoyles and so on. They pretty much snuck all the way up the tower, found said redeemed hill giant who was sleeping by the way, and proceeded to murder him. Like, just straight up murdered him in his sleep. And after tossing the corpse of the hill giant down the tower, I think I said all the inhabitants were rather intimidated and fled. Because you don't take out a hill giant like it's nothing without having the skills to back it up. We didn't though. We were a party of level 5 evil spellcasters and the hill giant just happened to be sleeping at the time. 
We had a town next to this tower that the party also eventually took over by the name of Celestia. And this was way back in 2004, 2005, so no, it had no connection to pastel colored ponies. We were around level 10 or 11 or so when we went out on an adventure way away from the city to collect something for some ritual or some such. Evil. What you do. When we had come back, we found that the previous tenants from the Tower of Woe came back and took our town and tower right back over. Naturally, this wouldn't slide. So, through their combined magics, Seal and Frey had pretty much destroyed the Tower of Woe. They took out the base of the tower and just watched it fall. Had an entire adventure in there too. Some plot stuff, interesting characters and battles they would have loved and they just watched it all crumble. I think it was around this point that I realized I shouldn't expect my players to get railroaded with a semblance of plot. Not Henderson's level of derailing, mind you, but certainly made me retool what I had for the City of Celestia itself. Pretty much moved some of the encounters from the tower to Celestia so they'd still find them, but just found them doing different things. Like, instead of working on destroying ancient tomes of foul magic, they were helping the sick or homeless, and then they realized the party was there, and they were all, What ho, villain! Thy blood shall run through the streets to signify the freedom from your tyranny. That kind of thing. The highest point, though, of all of this bloodshed from reclaiming Celestia came from the inside of the castle itself. We had snuck in, having to take out a guard here, a guard there, still blasting one guy's head off, errant chopping and stabbing through more, Frey's butterfly shooting lightning through a line of guys till we found the main chapel. There was a high and mighty paladin that was originally from the tower, then he was there trying to sanctify the entire place. We had faced him like two or three other times before while he tried to take back the city at other points, but he always failed. He was about to consecrate the entire castle when we barged in. The paladin drew his sword, Errant drew his spear, the fledgling paladins followed their leader, Frey was preparing a fireball, and then Sil yells, WAIT! Everybody stopped. Sil continued, I do not enjoy a fair fight, but if I must, then I must. May the best man win. Put her there. And approached the paladin with a handshake. He was bluffing, by the way. He had a one a day, ironically, ability he was going to cast on the paladin, where his blood would more or less just explode from his body in a glorious, gory fashion. A glorious fashion, if you will. I relooked at the paladin's stats, and he didn't have any ranks in Sense Motive. Sil had put a point in bluff every freaking level, and he had all of the charisma to back it up. Even as much as the Paladin didn't trust the Diablos, there was no way he was going to tell Sil's intentions. Well, then we rolled off and the Paladin rolled a 2. Sil rolled something like 15 and with his bonuses, the Paladin was all too happy to sheathe his sword, walk up to the Sil and take his hand. And have his body just blow up in a massive gory fashion. He hit nearly max damage too, so the Paladin had to roll for the damage threshold of instant death. I think you may have felt that though. Having your entire backside explode in a bloody mess like an exit wound from a point blank shotgun, it's got some good reason to fail it. Mind you, by the way, that the whole, may the best man win, put her there, that was a Spaceballs quote. And possibly the best use of a Spaceballs quote I have ever seen. I really love it when it comes to players and characters that end up taking a quote from something and using it to the best of the abilities. And that right there just was the epitome of it. I honestly can't say I have ever faced a situation that has taken the quote of a movie like Spaceballs and put it to good use. Needless to say, we retook the castle after that too. It's kind of demoralizing to see your leader become this chunky pool of blood, and there were many lashing of servants that didn't do their job right, what with the castle being taken over and all that. And that's why good is dumb. I hope you all enjoyed this retelling. I know the first time I told this was slow and meandering at best, and I hope this makes up for it. 
thank you all for watching and listening. I have more D&D stories, and as I remember them, I'll be coming out with more D&D stories. If you want to check out the channel, I have some Let's Plays of D&D games as well. Temple of Elemental Evil and D&D Heroes are two of my favorites I've played through so far. And if you want to watch me suffer, I have games like the Game Boy Advance port of I Am Beholder and Daggerdale. Painful. Remember, like, comment, subscribe if you want to support my content and share my stories if you want. That also is a big help. I hope more people can get a kick out of them. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. Cheers.